So good evening, good, good morning to everyone that's dialed in from all over the world. We're delighted to welcome you to this second annual mediation lecture in Hong Kong. Uh, my name is Simon Chapman uh, from Herbert Smith Freehills uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, we're very proud sponsors of the mediation lecture this year and delighted that this has become a real fixture of Hong Kong Legal Week. Um, obviously, the lecture this year is taking place in a virtual format rather than physically in person. But that does mean that we've been able to reach a very wide audience. We have almost 300 people uh, signed up for the lecture this evening, which promises to be uh, a really interesting discussion. Um, and we're particularly pleased to have um, Mark uh, Appel, who's joined us all the way from Malta, um, this evening uh, to deliver his lecture. Um, and I will hand over in a minute to uh, the Secretary for Justice, who will introduce Mark um, in a bit more detail. I just wanted to say um, how pleased we all were um, to see so much interest uh, in mediation with all of the events that are taking place uh, this week. Of course, there is uh, the Set Piece Mediation Conference, which takes place uh, on Friday. Um, events like this are really important um, for us as a firm to be associated with. Um, it's particularly important for us to connect and to collaborate with uh, colleagues and friends across the region and today, of course, across the globe um, to discuss trends uh, in dispute resolution and in particular in mediation and best practices. And we're very much looking forward to hear Mark speak about some of uh, the themes in investor state mediation today. We've committed to sponsor this lecture over the next five years. Um, and we, of course, hope to see many of you again next year, hopefully some of you uh, in person rather than just over um, a screen. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions of the speaker at the end of uh, the lecture today, just as there would be in a physical format. Um, you will see a Q&A button, hopefully, uh, on your screen. Please do send through any questions that you have over the course uh, of the lecture. Um, we, they will only be visible uh, to the three of us, uh, and we will select the best questions and, and ask Mark um, to comment on those at the end of the lecture. But please do send through any questions that you have um, that you would like Mark to address. Uh, in due course. So without further ado, I wanted to hand over to the Secretary for Justice, um, who will welcome Mark and introduce Mark more formally uh, today. But uh, thank you again to everyone that has joined in. Um, and uh, we look forward to a very interesting lecture. Good evening, Simon, and good afternoon, Mark. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here to say a few words. Uh, the uh, annual Hong Kong Mediation Lecture is actually, as, as Simon was saying, it's going to be one of the fixtures of the Hong Kong Legal Week. Uh, we started last year, and uh, we are very, very pleased and honoured for Herbert Smith Freehills to agree to sponsor it for uh, five years, and we hope that this will continue to be be a very good tradition that we in Hong Kong will be able to contribute to the development of mediation. Um, it's very interesting also um, for Herbert Smith Free Hills to be to be related in this way because I think I understand that um, not only are they one of the largest uh, uh, leading global law firm, but they have um, in the law firm that provides alternative legal services in China, and I think that's an interesting aspect to note. And of course, um, the current chief executive of, um, office, uh, um, the CEO, um, Justin D'Agostino, has been in Hong Kong for a long time. And I'm very pleased that he's able to station here in Hong Kong whilst um, heading this law firm. So keeping the link in Hong Kong and putting Hong Kong also on the map, on the global map in that way. Uh, the evening tonight about uh, the uh, mediation lecture is also a very interesting subject, something also we in Hong Kong have been trying to promote, uh, investment 
mediation. We've been running investment law and mediation training courses for the past two years, uh, but for the COVID-19 pandemic, it would be another, the third time this year, but we're going to reschedule it. And this is a very important subject, and I think it is ticking up a lot of it. Um, attraction. Um, for example, uh, next Monday, the UNCITRA pre-intercession pre meeting, we will also be talking about investment mediation. So I'm sure we will be hearing a lot more on this subject. But most importantly tonight, we are very pleased to have Mr. Mark Capel to talk to us on this very interesting topic, investor state mediation at the tipping points. Uh, Mark is a long-term friend. We've known each other a long time. We And most of you may know him through his um, senior executive positions at the American Arbitration Association and the International Center for Dispute Resolution. But some of you may not know, and I think it's very relevant to what we're hearing tonight is that since 2016, Mark has served as the chair of the IMI Investor State Mediation Task Force, working with state and investor representatives, expert academics, the Energy Charter Secretariat, Exit and UNCITRA on investor state dispute settlement uh, reform and mediation in particular. Last year, uh, uh, Mark was able to join us in Hong Kong and spoke at the Department of Justice's Mediate First Pledge 2019, Mediate First, Unlocking Potential, and he spoke on, Can Mediators Be Deal Makers? And uh, it was a very impressive session, and uh, thank you very much, Mark, for uh, sharing us uh, your expertise last year, and of course, um, again, sharing us your insights and expertise here uh, with us tonight. I'm sure all of you are very eager to listen to Mark and um, to, to learn from his experiences. And uh, I will say no more and pass on, if I may, uh, to Mark to share with us his expertise on this very interesting topic. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for that uh, very, very kind introduction. Um, uh, I am only sorry not to be present with you uh, uh, today with friends and family uh, in Hong Kong, but uh, another day, perhaps. Um, the, the subject of my uh, uh, presentation, uh, which is investor state uh, mediation, uh, is in fact um, uh, a, uh, a, a theme or a, a study in leadership, uh, both personal and institutional. Uh, and I can think of no, uh, no two better hosts uh, for this particular topic uh, than the uh, Hong Kong Department of Justice and Herbert Smith, uh, a Hong Kong DOJ, uh, for their mediation first policy, uh, and Herbert Smith for their Her Herbert Smith Freehills for their longstanding uh, activity in the mediation field, and their particular leadership on mediation advocacy. So this is a real pleasure. Some of you may be familiar with uh, the Tipping Point, uh, a book by uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, uh, in that book, as well as in a follow-up book called Blink, uh, Gladwell looks at how and when uh, change occurs. Uh, what is that magic point in time, the tipping point, uh, when that most powerful uh, of forces, inertia, uh, stops holding back change and necessary change? Uh, the topic of my speech seems to have arrived at that time and place. Uh, but what were the sticking points? Uh, what was required and what is required for change to occur? What accumulated events uh, have led us to this place? So let's explore. You could be uh, forgiven for asking why assisted voluntary settlements are a novel idea uh, in investor state relations. Uh, after all, uh, mediation is well established globally as an efficient and effective conflict settlement uh, tool uh, from uh, divorce and child custody actions 
to major commercial disputes. Mediators uh, globally work with parties to create process, facilitate effective communication, and assist the creation of sustainable solutions. Um, so why not investor state mediation? Uh, well, certainly it's not the absence of problems. Uh, conflict is natural in any commercial relationship. Uh, but adding in significantly different goals, so uh, the investor's uh, profit motive on the one hand, and the state's uh, uh, interest in uh, public interest, an interest in public uh, well-being on the other, would seem to increase the opportunity for disputes significantly. In 2018, uh, ICSID, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, uh, had 56 cases uh, of filed. Um, I note uh, parenthetically that ICSID had uh, 21 cases filed in 2008. So that's something like a 200% increase over 10 years. Not bad in terms of growth. Um, but mediation's growth and, and, and mediation success is, is in significant part um, due to the opportunity to craft negotiated solutions, solutions that aren't proscribed by either contract or law. So whether it be an extension of time uh, or negotiated price uh, or resource requirements. In 2016, an internationalist, a friend of mine, and I think a, a friend of the secretary's as well, uh, hearing that I involved myself in investor state mediation said to me, uh, investor state mediation won't work. Uh, states don't settle, uh, but it seems they do. Um, uh, so between uh, 1966 and 2020, ICSID reports that 35, some 35 percent of the cases uh, never went to conclusion, never went to decision. Now, um, other reasons beyond settlement uh, exist, so exhaustion of funds, uh, voluntary claim withdrawal, but I think it's fair to assume that a fair number of those cases were removed after a negotiated settlement was reached. And at its heart, mediation is a simple extension of the negotiation process. It's enhanced negotiation. Negotiation plus one, the mediator. So why not mediation in investor state cases? Well, it turns out there was a whole host of reasons, uh, but distilled Many of them come down to trust. Uh, investors and states uh, won't use a process they don't trust. Uh, the good news is that over the last eight years, much has been done uh, to provide needed education and address legitimate concerns with the investor state mediation process. So what follows now in my remarks is a bit of an event chronology. Uh, with object lessons in leadership, uh, in effective communication, and in innovation. In 2012, the International Bar Association published a set of investor state uh, mediation rules. Uh, the drafting committee was chaired by two veteran investor state practitioners, uh, Anna Jubin Brett and Bart Legum. At the time, Anna was in private practice. Now she is the chief legal officer of UNCITRAL. Uh, before moving to private practice, Bart, of course, had worked for uh, the US State Department. So plenty of experience there. Uh, the drafting committee for the IBA rules read like a who's who of internationalists' uh, leadership counts, uh, as do rules. Rules like legislation, uh, are, uh, uh, make, make, make uh, practice legitimate. They normalize practice. Uh, they also set the standard uh, for what 
processed consumers can expect. I'm recalling now one of my own uh, law school professors who, who too many years ago uh, held up a, a set of, of procedures, you know, a set of, uh, in this case, commercial arbitration procedures, and said they reflect the common law uh, for that process. Uh, the IBA uh, investor state uh, rules addressed both novel and best practice approaches to mediation for investor state cases. By way of example, they addressed the possibility uh, that two mediators or co-mediators might be utilized. Why two? Why two? Well, think of an investment project uh, in trouble over community environmental or labor, labor and employment issues. Might it not be helpful to have an experienced, uh, treaty savvy mediator working in concert with a trusted, locally based mediator more in tune with community concerns? The IBA rules also adopted best practice in mediation, speaking to an organizational meeting mediation management meeting, and recognizing the value uh, of addressing critical issues up front, uh, including language or languages, uh, pending arbitral or judicial proceedings, and their impact on the process. The possibility of adding additional parties to the mediation whose, whose participation might be critical to its success, privacy, and confidentiality issues and any special requirements for ratification of the ultimate mediated, negotiated settlement. I'll speak to uh, two other sets of rules later, but uh, in truth, in 2012, uh, the IBA leadership raised the bar. The intersection of public international law uh, and commercial law has always made for an interesting debate regarding what skill set and knowledge base are best suited to the resolution of IS, or investor state claims. Uh, add uh, political considerations, the possibilities of multiple forums, so arbitration, mediation, court actions, and widely disparate cultural dynamics that mix, and you might start to appreciate the challenge of identifying the right person to assist the negotiation of investor state disputes. Um, in one of the first uh, reported uh, investor state mediation cases, the parties used the services of uh, one Robert Strauss. Uh, Robert was a legendary attorney an advisor to three U.S. presidents and multiple corporate CEOs. Uh, talk about uh, setting the bar high. In 2014, the IMI, the International Mediation Institute, recognizing an opportunity uh, to support mediation in investor state relations, created the IMI Investor State Mediation Task Force. The first co-chairs of the task force were Jubin Brett and Bart Legger. Importantly, the task force took on the subject of qualifying investor state mediators, bringing in many of the same uh, international experts, uh, academics, arbitrators, mediators, and, and institutional representatives who've been actively engaged in bringing investor state mediation to the fore. In 2016, I inherited uh, Anna and Bart's uh, good efforts uh, as chair, and in September of 2016, IMI published its competency criteria for investor state mediators. It's available in detail on the IMI website, but it lays out uh, six areas for examination. An understanding of investor state issues, experience in mediation and other dispute resolution processes, so the need to understand multiple fora, experience with different types of negotiation, mediation, and conciliation, 
understanding of arbitration, and not surprisingly in this context, intercultural competency. And then lastly, a, a broad omnibus uh, catch-all other competencies. So uh, subject matter expertise is useful, process management sk skills obviously useful, technological know-how wasn't that forward thinking considering our, our reliance on ODR, on online dispute resolution now. Uh, by way of comment, uh, we mediators uh, understand that you take parties as you find them. And so they come from different cultures, uh, different legal and, and political business uh, systems. Uh, uh, they hear and, and, and speak uh, uh, differently, and so different styles of mediation really must be contemplated. I'm remembering, again, a comment uh, from a colleague many, many years ago who asked if she was facilitative uh, or uh, evaluative in style. She replied, yes. So she said, I facilitate in the morning and I evaluate in the afternoon. The selection of the mediator uh, uh, could could be a topic on its own for one of these talks, but it's important because it gives process consumers a baseline uh, in terms of uh, expertise and experience to consider. Um, perhaps needless to say, it's a tall order to find someone who ticks all of the boxes uh, I've already given you. So what do you do? Well, uh, I've mentioned earlier the involvement of leading investor state ADR institutions, so the Energy Charter, Secretariat, ICSID, and ONCETRAL. Um, those same institutions, supported by IMI, and working in close concert with the Center for Effective Dispute Resolution, CEDAR, developed and delivered, this is pre-pandemic, a global series of investor state uh, mediator training programs. Unsurprisingly, uh, those programs uh, were built around the IMI criteria. They included intensive sessions uh, on um, uh, ISDS environment, ISDS law, and ISDS practice, uh, followed by a mediation skills training built to suit the investor state environment. By way of example, uh, one of the role plays uh, in the training program uh, involved a civil society uh, organization participating in the negotiation process. Uh, per perhaps uh, not surprising, the attendees came from different worlds. So they were, they were international, uh, public international lawyers. They were uh, investor state arbitrators. They were uh, commercial mediators. I had the privilege of attending one of those as faculty, and I can tell you they were extraordinary. It was extraordinary. So courtesy thought leaders, uh, broad parameters of investor state procedure uh, is in place. The question of mediator competency and quality is being addressed. But nagging doubts still existed. A 2016 survey of experienced ISDS practitioners uh, by the Center for International Law National University of Singapore uh, pointed up some concerns. Uh, it was the strong consensus of those surveyed that states would find the mediation option more problematic uh, than, than investors. Number one among perceived obstacles to acceptance uh, was the perception that states preferred to defer their decision to a third party give it to an arbitrator. I don't, wanna, I don't want to make this decision. Um, why, you may ask. Dig a bit deeper, as they did, and you'll find out why. Obstacle number three was the first of, of, ob of objections entitled fear. In this case, fear of public criticism. Uh, also, fear number seven, fear of future prosecution for corruption. Uh, or... Fear number 16, fear of setting a bad precedent. As any student of history or business management will tell you, fear is a great motivator. 
uh, or as in this case, a, a demotivator. Now, having already staked out a, uh, a leadership role, uh, IS uh, ADR institutions once more stepped into the breach, um, starting with the Energy Charter uh, Conference, Energy Charter Secretariat. Uh, our, uh, Alejandro Carballo laid a staff uh, in 2016 uh, understanding full well that um, neither investors nor states would participate in a process they didn't understand, uh, worked with IMI, with the task force, uh, to draft an investor state uh, guide to the mediation process. The guide is comprehensive uh, in nature, addressing both practical and procedural considerations. So by way uh, of example, considering when is the right time to mediate, or, or how to prepare for mediation, or how to provide for transparency, yeah, important in public matters, even while allowing for necessary confidentiality in the negotiation process. But the, but the ECT didn't stop there. Uh, instead, they carried out a long series of running separate workshops and seminars with government representatives, investors, and uh, investor state dispute settlement experts. That dialogue allowed uh, ECT to explore many of the concerns uh, addressed in the uh, Singapore uh, survey, minimizing some and illuminating uh, uh, causes and possible solutions uh, for others. Here are a couple of examples. Uh, it's always been assumed that the need for transparency uh, would limit states' ability to uh, negotiate complex uh, contract and treaty-based claims. But, but state representatives reported they, that they had found ways to maintain transparency. Uh, so, reporting on the existence of the dispute, transparency. Uh, reporting on the outcome uh, of the uh, 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 settlement, uh, reporting that the parties were engaged in negotiation, all, all, all transparency, all the while preserving the confidentiality of the negotiation sessions themselves. A less anticipated problem uh, proved much tougher. It turns out that many states lacked, and I suspect still lack, um, necessary structural and policy support for mediated negotiation. Too often, even if the state wanted to mediate, there was either a scattered, limited, or no process in place, or a budget uh, to turn to. So the state literally had no way to pay a mediator. You can hire one, but not pay them, unfortunately. On receiving this feedback from the Secretariat, the Energy Charter Conference uh, charged the Secretariat uh, with drafting a protocol or protocols uh, that could voluntarily be utilized by states, either by way of developing a domestic investor state dispute resolution framework or serving as guidance concerning the practical and legal issues that should be considered by states in developing a conflict management plan uh, for investment disputes. ECC, ECT staff uh, started working on these issues with a select uh, subcommittee of the IMI, Investor State Mediation Task Force. ECT also continued its discussions with state representatives investor state institutions. The resulting energy charter model instrument on, on management of investment disputes. I'll say it again. Energy charter model instrument on management of investment disputes uh, uh, delivers uh, the requested comprehensive approach to investor state management. Uh, so the um, uh, model instrument makes conflict management good policy, creates an administrative and budgetary framework, uh, addresses the need for early and effective intra-between 
agencies. Communication and cooperation requires it. Balances competing needs for transparency and confidentiality. Importantly, the model instrument produced a really innovative idea. Um, a way to address legitimate concerns about political backlash and potential charges of corruption. Uh, creating a multi-agency commission. So finance, state, you know, multiple agencies to manage treaty-based disputes. Simply stated, shared decision-making Shared, shared success. Earlier, when talking about the uh, IBA investor state mediation rules, I spoke to the power of, of procedural rules in terms of legitimizing and, and normalizing uh, processes. It should come as no surprise then that as mediation has become uh, better known, um, uh, uh, ICSID, World Bank, and UNCITRA, uh separately took up the challenge of drafting uh, new mediation rules. Uh, for reasons I'll explain briefly, those rules are, are different. Uh, I'll start with ICSID. ICSID staff, uh, and Frau Kanichka in particular, have been part of virtually every major new initiative in the development of investor state mediation. From the start, ICSID faced two issues. Uh, many, if not most of you will know, that ICSID has featured uh, for years a conciliation process as opposed to mediation. The terms conciliation uh, and mediation are frequently confused, and for many, mean one and the same. Uh, but ICSID's process was well-defined, if, if less frequently used, and clearly wouldn't meet current expectations of the mediation process. Uh, and speaking of process, whatever mediation process ICSID uh, uh, published and will publish will need to do dovetail or fit you know, with uh, existing ICSID administrative process. So like uh, the Energy Charter Secretary, ICSID engaged in lengthy conversation uh, with ISDS users, arbitrators, uh, mediators, experts, and academicians. What has resulted to date, and I say to date, uh, the hope is that the ICSID mediation rules will be adopted in 2021, uh, is really a bespoke investor state mediation process. Uh, the rules are detailed. Uh, in terms of filing and registration requirements. Um, but it strikes me that's natural, uh, given their place in the larger ICSID uh, dispute, uh, this, this dispute settlement process. Happily, happily, they also reference uh, several ISDS specific opportunities and needs. By way of example, uh, the uh, draft uh, ICSID rules specifically address the possibility of one or two mediators, co-mediation. They also recognize that the more complex nature of investor state disputes will benefit substantially from fulsome uh, early discussion of procedural matters. The first session, as it's captured by the rules, suggests discussion of representation, communication, uh, confidentiality, uh, and ratification issues, among others. Important. Early discussion avoids misunderstandings later. So you can imagine uh, one of your uh, uh, commercial colleagues uh, now asking you, why is it taking so long for them to respond? And you happily will have an answer. Um, early discussion also agreement on procedural matters creates what we, we uh, in the mediation or the negotiation field like to call habits of agreement. Uh, uh, gets, gets things wrong. It's a good thing. It sets, it sets a good 
uh, a good table for further discussion. Um, there are subjects that aren't mentioned in the rules uh, and might be considered. So, for example, um, uh, something I would consider and mediators will certainly think about uh, addressing in that uh, uh, early uh, management conference is uh, addressing the issue of public pronouncements or public communications. For those of you active in, in the public fora, how many times have you heard better to avoid negotiating through the press? Um, uh, now, the draft UNCITRAL rules, so I'll change it now. We're now uh, uh, talking UNCITRAL as opposed to ICSID. I have taken a different course, but again for good reason. Uh, the UNCITRAL rules historically have been the global standard uh, for a whole host of commercial disputes. Uh, they, they, any, any UNCITRAL rules uh, would necessarily be less focused on any particular commercial use, let alone uh, uh, something as specific or esoteric uh, as, the, as investor state mediation. So that's resulted in, in simplified, or perhaps you could characterize them as only the essential By way of example, the UNCITRAL rules speak to when mediation begins and ends, appointment of the mediator or mediators, conduct of the mediation, and communication, uh, including provisions for an early meeting, uh, confidentiality. By the way, confidentiality is all. Um, so we found that the UNCITRAL rules settlement agreement itself is confidential, absent the agreement of the parties otherwise, uh, or is required by law or is required for enforcement. And the non-admissibility of mediation communications and other proceedings. Uh, the settlement agreement is addressed, and particularly in the context of the enforcement regime. So now UNCITRAL is thinking about the Singapore Convention and mediator immunity. So immunity from service process. We don't want mediators testifying in post-mediation proceedings uh, uh, after the fact, and limitation of liability of, of, of for mediators. Uh, I note, and and you can see on the UNCITRAL um, uh, sort of legislative pages and uh, commission notes that there have been some very useful comments from various states of the draft. Notable. Among them uh, are calls from both China uh, and Italy uh, to make express uh, the option of online uh, dispute resolution as an option. Uh, how appropriate in light of uh, today's uh, events and the common now uh, OBR uh, mediation. Uh, what should uh, prove uh, of immense value to parties and practitioners alike. Uh, is the draft UNCITRAL notes on mediation also forthcoming. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the UNCITRAL notes for organizing the arbitration uh, of proceedings, originally published in uh, 1996, uh, I think, and uh, uh, updated in, uh, in 2016. Uh, the mediation notes, uh, UNCITRAL mediation notes, uh, provide both rationale for the uh, procedures themselves and also practical advice uh, concerning organization, uh, conduct of the proceedings, uh, including OBR, uh, and enforcement issues speaking to the convention, which, of course, brings me to uh, perhaps uh, 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 the single most uh, important contributor to increased confidence uh, in international mediation, uh, which is the Singapore. Many of our colleagues uh, in the mediation community could be uh, forgiven for understanding the need for an enforcement mechanism for mediation. After all, mediated settlements are arrived at voluntarily by the parties. I recall a study uh, favorably, favorably comparing the staying power of mediated settlements uh, to judicial orders in the United States some 40 years ago. Long, long time history. Still, uh, we're trying to change perceptions. Uh, and 
some issues. So it is a fact that in many jurisdictions, a mediated settlement uh, requiring future performance, future performance is tantamount to a contract with the usual defenses to enforce. So lack of agreement on essential terms, uh, lack of authority. And that has made um, users uncertain. Certainty does not bring success, and certainty doesn't bring use. At the 2016-2017 uh, International Mediation Institute Global Pound uh, Conference, uh, one of the top-ranked, uh, in fact, maybe it was the top-ranked uh, need process uh, uh, change of users uh, was legislation uh, for enforcement and recognition of mediated agreements. Enter the United Nations Convention uh, uh, on International Settlement Agreements Resulting from Mediation. The Singapore Convention. The Singapore Convention provides a simple, straightforward, uh, global uh, mediate, mediation settlements and enforcement, enforcement regime. A couple of quick notes. The convention is designed to act as a shield as well as a sword. So it's for enforcement, but it's also for protection. So protection against future uh, legal actions. We had a, a protectionist, quote unquote, already settled. In deference to states, yes, so comity, um, the convention uh, uh, relies on existing state enforcement regimes. Now, there are issues. Huh? So um, uh, the convention uh, has grounds for, set for setting aside mediated agreements, including public policy. So... Clearly, attention will need to be paid post ratification uh, to court decisions in particular jurisdictions. Finally, I've noted um, that three ratifying uh, states uh, Belarus, uh, Iran, and Saudi Arabia have exempted the state from coverage under the Convention. With respect, I think that's a lost leadership, uh, lost revenue opportunity. Uh, states, uh, and particularly states wishing to encourage foreign direct investment, will, deal, will do well to include uh, state agreements within the protections afforded by the convention. This is especially true given developments in the uh, the state is in a, possession, in, in, in a position to establish an enforcement regime uh, itself. And readily available tools like the Energy Charter model instrument uh, for management of investor state conflict uh, are, are available to states to, to, to uh, create that regime. So effective state notice, uh, thorough preparation by the state, vetting, uh, and response. I'll mention one other thing in about a minute, I think. Um, the convention's second opt-out or option is reserving uh, uh, a finality in terms of the settlement agreement until the time of mediation. Uh, I could see an argument being made for the state that for, for settlements involving the state, that settlement should be agreed to at the time of mediation. What it would do, and I'm now thinking with a state hat on, uh, it would give me leverage yeah, at the negotiation table. So I am now in the position of saying not only are we going to agree, but we're going to agree and the agreement is going to be enforceable under the Singapore Convention. Now, um, uh, implementation and dialogue and process goes on. Uh, notably at UNCITRAL Working Group 3, 
uh, where investor state uh, uh, form, uh, is going on, and I am told that, that investment mediation is a uh, important uh, topic of discussion. So, uh, what about results? Uh, as the uh, old proverb says, the proof of the pudding uh, is in the eating. In a recently reported IS uh, mediation, I should say successfully uh, successful mediation, the profile of the meeting who assisted uh, the uh, reporting state investor uh, uh, looks a whole lot, if you look at her profile, looks very much uh, like the IMI investor state uh, uh, mediation criteria. Also, today, uh, in anticipation of this uh, 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 seminar, I noted the uh, that on the IMI website, the page featuring the energy charter model instrument uh, has been downloaded 16,000 times. So someone's interested. For those of us familiar with the history of the New York Convention, it might come as something as a, a, of a surprise uh, or perhaps a delight uh, that to date some 55 states uh, have adopted the convention. Now you might say, what about COVID? Yeah, one of our discussions every day, it seems. Well, if anything, it seems to me COVID has accelerated the need uh, for negotiated solutions. Uh, investors are plagued with supply chain disruptions, with employee uh, availability, employee health. States, uh, on the other hand, are reallocating budgets to address dire uh, public health uh, and economic uh, circumstances brought on by the pandemic. So, I'll end as I started. Uh, is investor state uh, mediation at the tipping point? I think so. Uh, but time will tell. Uh, kind thanks for your attention. Uh, and I welcome a few questions. Mark, thank you so much for that um, really fascinating um, uh, overview of the, the issues in relation to investor state mediation. Um, you touched on a large number of, of topics that I think will be of, of interest to those who have joined us um, remotely. Um, and I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that you're free to submit questions uh, in the Q&A uh, button, which should appear uh, somewhere towards the, the bottom of your screen if you do have questions for Mark. Um, we did have a couple of questions already that have come through uh, over the course of the uh, lecture. Um, the first question, Mark, was a, a sort of practical question in relation to timing. And you talked about the um, uh, sort of effectiveness uh, of uh, investor state mediation more generally. In, in your view, do you think it's more likely that there would be um, a better uptake for uptake rather for investors um, using the mediation process as a remedy of first resort, if you like, so before any formal proceedings are commenced? Or is it more likely that the draft rules that you've talked us through will be invoked more frequently while some form of formal proceeding is already underway? Yeah, um, thanks, Simon. Great question. Um, I, I have to say I'm, I'm reminded on this uh, day of the, uh, 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 I guess, the, the day after the U.S. elections, of something I used to hear in the U.S. about Chicago. They would say, vote early and often. Uh, and I think, I think mediation should really be contemplated early and often. 
Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, mediation is an excellent conflict management tool. And you need not have a, um, a, even a claim in place uh, to take advantage of the um, a mediation process. I think the best users of the process, uh, again, now uh, speaking to both states and investors, uh, why wait uh, to, for it to get to the uh, a point where someone needs to file uh, for uh, uh, investor state uh, arbitration? Why not engage uh, a mediator when the problem surfaces? Uh, while there are still uh, multiple uh, sort of creative and effective uh, problem-solving solutions available. You know, so, so I really appreciate that question. Uh, now, I have to say, uh, uh, is it still effective uh, at, the time of, uh, uh, at the time of and during uh, an investor state uh, arbitration? And again, I would say yes, uh, uh, perhaps in parallel. Uh, uh, frankly, I think mediation, and I've seen it work, in a post-award context, uh, because it's lovely to win, but it's important to collect. Uh, and uh, mediation can be a, a great way of, of taking a decision of some kind and then negotiating uh, a, um, uh, an outcome that is uh, agreeable to, uh, to the parties. So uh, I guess, Simon, uh, early and often is how I would answer that question. That's a good answer. One question that's just come in. Um, you've talked to us over the course uh, of this uh, lecture about the development, uh, the history of uh, mediation in the context of um, ISDS matters. Um, one question we've had from somebody uh, who's dialed in is to ask you to look into your crystal ball and tell us what do you think about the development of investment mediation perhaps over the next 10 years, so looking into the future? Yeah. Okay, that's a great question. And uh, of course, it's, it is, as we all know, dangerous, uh, at the very least, to, to try to pro prognosticate. Uh, but um, uh, if we are at the tipping point, um, uh, think about the universe of cases. If 35% if of the cases that are being, even only 35% of the cases uh, uh, at, at exit uh, are being resolved uh, short uh, of, uh, of a, a hearing. That's a terrific number of, of mediations to start with. And assuming, and I, I think we have to assume that globalization uh, will continue, no matter our politics of the moment globally, wherever uh, we may be uh, located, we really have come to rely on each other. I think mediation will have a far rosier uh, uh, future uh, in terms of use as, as a conflict management and dispute settlement tool uh, uh, for investor state mediations. So I think it's if, uh, if, the, if the person who submitted that question, I would say, you know, get, it, get that training now because it's coming. And um, one topic that you touched upon was um, some of the training that's being given. Um, or produced to prepare people to be good mediators in the context of ISDS cases. Um, do you think that people who are good arbitrators can also be good mediators? It's a, it's a very good question. It's the same question we, I used to be asked when I was asked to, whether judges uh, would make a good mediators. And, and of course, you, you give them the famous lawyer's answer, which is, it depends. Um, you know, uh, I, I, think, I think some arbitrators uh, uh, actually have very good uh, uh, communicate, interpersonal communication skills, uh, can work with parties. Uh, some of them exhibit that, I think, in the, uh, the best of them, uh, in a, a preliminary hearing context. Look at the ones who really draw out agreements, uh, uh, draw out stipulations. I think arbitrators who have that kind of approach are going to be better suited uh, to serve as mediators. Having said that, uh, mediation and arbitration are very different skill sets. Uh, and just as there are some mediators who really would not do so well as arbitrators, there are some arbitrators who would not do so well as mediators. 
And then perhaps one, one final question, just as we're coming up to the hour. Um, you talked uh, about the um, confidentiality of, of mediation proceedings, and I think you mentioned that um, for some of the draft rules, confidentiality is baked in by default, not just for the mediation itself, but also the any settlement agreement that is reached as a result of the discussions. Do you think that there's a slight tension between the obvious need for privacy and confidentiality in the mediation context and the push for greater transparency um, with regard to the settlement of investor state disputes more generally, sort of this push for more information to be um, published in the public domain. Is, is there an inherent tension, do you think, there? Sure, and, uh, absolutely. And, and speaking from Europe, where you know we saw a really cascading sort of uh, a public, very public and very heated uh, suggestions that uh, 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 investor state arbitration was somehow a, you know, smoky room sort of agreement, uh, 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 you know, smoke-filled room sort of environment where people, you know, came to decisions that affected the public. So, so clearly that concern exists whenever you involve a public entities. Having said that, though, yeah. Um, uh, it was very interesting uh, discussions at the uh, Energy Charter Organization to hear governments um, uh, say that by making uh, particular aspects of the process transparent. So uh, we support it. By the way, it's easier if you have a policy supporting mediation. Yeah. So now you say, of course, we're mediating. We mediate whenever we have a problem. Um, and then after that, uh, we're in a negotiation with X. But then, you know, you don't bring the camera into the negotiation room. Um, maybe you agree with the mediator as to the mediator perhaps saying what's going on. The mediator will say something like, we're engaged in frank discussions. Okay? And then, ideally, the parties then make public the ultimate settlement agreement. So there is a way. Uh, the tension absolutely exists, but there is a way to address it. Um, parenthetically, I will, I, I, I know that the uh, ICSID rules actually have gone back and forth on the issue of what's confidential. And they now require confidentiality for every aspect of the process. So that shows you just how sensitive that issue is. Well, Mark, we're, we're right on the hour. It's uh, exactly 8 o'clock in the evening uh, in Hong Kong, so perfect timing. Um, thank you again. It was a, a terrific lecture, a really interesting review of what is a fascinating topic. Um, and as you said a few moments ago, a topic that's likely to see sort of significant development um, over the next decade. So thank you again for agreeing to be our speaker at the second uh, annual Hong Kong mediation lecture. And thank you to, to everyone that's, that's dialed in and that has asked questions. It's great to see so many people from so many different parts of the world uh, and lots of different organizations represented this evening. Um, so thank you all and uh, wish you all a very uh, good evening. Thanks, Simon.